your brain wants to keep you in your safety zone. As you start venturing outside of your comfort zone, your brain will start firing off these signals, basically trying to convince you to stay. Greatness and growth is always on the outside of that comfort zone. I have to take this risk. And it's not life or death. This is so funny that this is literally my fourth episode where I'm fully matching with I my I know. Guests. I love it. I feel like it's a good sign, though. <laughs> it's a good sign. We're at the end of the day, like, we're just girls. Like, we're just girls. We're just, just girls, girls in the like, city. Girls in the city. Girls trying to start companies. Yes. Yes. Um, so literally not surprised we're both wearing no. the, like, quintessential basic, like, black I love top. it. I love it. I'm fully sponsored by Aritzia right now with this outfit. Aritzia is so good. Oh. So good. It's like, it really spreads the line between being like chic and fun and trendy and then like professional. I don't know. I just love it. And I love, yeah. especially for work, I was even like this at the law firm. I would always stay true to my personal style. Which is so important yeah. to do. And I think also companies now are getting more comfortable with you coming yes. as yourself. Yes. I think also we're founders, right? Like at yes. the end of the day, we could be totally non-professional people. hundred percent. No one's telling us no. what to wear. No. But we no. obviously want to come across as like, okay, take us seriously. We're actually running real companies. Ex- exactly. Without sacrificing like the girly pop in us. Which 100%. Because really yeah. it's like, I get enjoyment. I don't know about you, but I get actually enjoyment out of getting dressed and styling myself. Oh, yeah. It's just like a form of self-expression. And if I wasn't able to do that, I feel like it would... Yeah, it'd make the days less fun. No, literally everything would be boring. Yeah, it'd be boring. I'm like, Sorry. what's the point? And it just makes me feel more motivated to like be outside and go to meetings and it just makes you feel more confident. Like you want to show up as the person you want to be, you know? You know, a random like side to- off topic, but it actually helped me really unlock content creation yeah. for me because I would force myself to get ready every day with like no agenda, nothing to do. And then I'm like, well, I already look so cute. Might as well make some content out of it. And I ended up pumping out a lot more content and getting a lot better faster. Smart. It's like kind of a good way to trick yourself into like being on camera is like, get yourself ready. You have nowhere to go. And then you'll be like, kind of like in the headspace of like, I'm I'm ready to be seen by a lot of people. Yes. Yes. And then actually show up on camera and like kind of the way you need to be. Yes. Oh my gosh. I think you might, that's such a good point. And I'm honestly someone that loves to like not wear makeup, especially like when, which is why I way prefer Zoom over Google Meet because of that face filter that you can use. <laughs> it's so real. <laughs> it is it's when so people real. send me a Google Meet, I'm like, I'm like, can rude. I replace the link with yes. my Zoom link that I pay for every month? Yes, like, not yes, horrible. exactly. <laughs> but in, whenever I do have the days where I actually get ready and put on makeup, you're so right. I feel so much more motivated to film content because otherwise I'm just like, yeah, and you're like, yeah. Oh. I'll finally go to that coffee chat I've been putting off. Exactly, exactly. I'll go get dinner with my friends today. Exactly. (laughs) I'll walk outside and not be a little, like, couch potato working. No, literally. Um, Well, let's get into it. Share the story about Flaus. And we have it here so you can show us. Yes, yes. So... I'm Sam. I'm the founder and CEO of Flouse. Um, we are the world's first electric flosser, similar to your electric toothbrush, but for flossing. So I actually brought you your own flouse. Um, and so I will just unpackage it. And so this is what the product looks like. It looks just like your electric toothbrush, but for flossing. It has three speeds if you actually want to touch the power button. And you're going to really feel those vibrations going in the floss itself. So how floss works is just like your electric toothbrush, but for flossing. So we use up to 18,000 sonic vibrations per minute, and it creates this left to right displacement motion that helps to wiggle the floss in between tight contacts, speeding up the whole process, helps to disrupt the biofilm and plaque, and then stimulate the gums. Um, And nearly 90% of our customers report flossing more regularly. So I don't know what your flossing habits are like, but most people are not flossing every single day. And so, but it's arguably even more important than brushing your teeth. No, I totally agree. I actually did not floss at all until very recently. Yes. I realized, wait a second, like I'm just not trying to get gum disease. This is not the vibe. Exactly. And, um, the regular traditional floss, which yes. what dentists use, yes. obviously is the best one. Yes. But no chance I'm doing that. No. I mean, like, way so too much work. It's And that's like what I found. So I was a twice a day electric toothbrush user and I just could never get into the pattern of flossing my teeth, especially with traditional string floss. I would tend to go towards a floss pick just because I didn't like how it would cut off circulation on my fingers. I didn't like shoving my fingers in my mouth. I also didn't like touching the dirty floss. And so after a dentist appointment, I came home and I thought, I hate flossing, but I love using my electric toothbrush. 
why don't I just go buy an electric flosser that could do it for me? And I went online to go purchase one and nothing existed. Yeah. And that's how this idea just came to be. It was literally that experience coming home and thinking, I'm going to go buy this mm-hmm. and then going online and not finding anything. It's very true. Actually, the floss pig doesn't do it. No, and it doesn't. You're always going to resort to that because it's that much easier than a, like a little thread. Exactly. And I what's so interesting, too, is coming into this from like outside of the dental care background. Obviously, I was a lawyer is that it then has allowed me to like question the status quo of like, OK, the ADA tells you you need to be using 18 inches of floss each time. And I just thought to myself, OK, why is that the case when we're using the same toothbrush bristles over and over again for three to six months at a time? And it, it, you're really contacting the same areas of, of the gum and the gum line. And so I started doing some research trying to find like clinical empirical evidence and there's none on why you're told to use 18 inches of floss. It's just something that's been passed down through generations of dental school, hashtag big floss. I don't know. Like it's so wild that there's no empirical evidence on this at all. And floss string itself is so harmful to the environment because it's so thin and little that whether ideally people aren't flushing it down the toilet, but a lot of people do, whether it's that or putting it into your trash can, your um, your local waste management facilities aren't able to properly process it because it's so thin and little. So it will slip through the sorters and then end up in our oceans and sea animals. So being able to do something like flouse where you're using so much less floss, you're using way less plastic and it's fully recyclable and we have a free recycling program. It's just, I think that's something that's so critically important, especially as a founder of a a daily consumable product is that you are thinking like, what impact is this going to have on the environment? I'm curious if this is your first entrepreneurial endeavor. Like, did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Yeah. um, So this was, this is my first like big entrepreneurial endeavor. But ever since I was a little kid, I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. So like when I was like six, I think I created a little clothing line with my best friend at the time. And then when I was at USC, um, this is right at the beginning of like the flower crown Coachella moment. I would sit there in my sorority dorm room and literally glue all these flower crowns. I made like $30,000 one year just in college from doing this. Then when I was in law school, I didn't, I didn't think the law school had any cute swag. So I went and designed all my own swag and sold it to people. So I've always had this like entrepreneurial spirit, but Flouse is for sure the first time I've actually like formed a company, had employees and done this. Also, I also went to USC. I don't know if you know you, this. No, I do know that. Fight on. Oh, my. <laughs> You're literally referencing the flower crown movement yes. to Coachella. I'm like, wow, like very throwback. Yes. <laughs> like, Throw I know back. exactly what you're talking about. Yes, and like game days. Like, I. Yes. oh, my gosh. I mean, and I feel like USC was an incredible school that really cultivated entrepreneurialism. Yeah. Like, it was just such a huge entrepreneurship school there is is really active there. They actually invested in Flouse and so did my law school. So to have my alma maters be supporting the brand is they, like the biggest honor. They have so many resources and they're actually so put their many. money with their mouth is yes. and they actually will invest in the company students are, yes. are, are actually building. And I remember yeah. like it was almost like entrepreneurship was so integrated in every school on campus that basically every other person was like dabbling in starting yes. a company, which oh was God, like phenomenal. Like, phenomenal. And what a great network to have too. Yeah. Like, like the alumni network there is so supportive and I totally agree. So I think USC really helped to start like cultivating that in me and like making me feel um, more courageous because it is really scary yeah. to go out on your own and do something that you've never done before. Yeah. And I know you say you're a first time founder, yeah. but a lot of those smaller ventures that you kind of did on the side is actually you just like giving your hand on it and like failing fast yes. earlier. Yes. So you're more likely to be successful now yes. because you there's like a lot of stuff in the beginning that you just have to go through that exactly. you don't have to go through in this town because you're like, I kind of did that on a smaller scale before. 100%. And that like yeah. kind of credit to USC for like having that spirit and like in the campus where you feel like, hey, no big deal. I'm gonna have a little business in my dorm room. Like it's not that deep. No, 100%. It's yeah. not that deep. It's not that scary. And then even at NYU Law, that school also had a really big emphasis on business. And so I would take a lot of the business school classes and they would have a lot of lawyers that would actually go in-house like general counsel and things like that. So that was a whole nother school where they were also really supportive of that. And so I agree, I think, and also I was, I ran for student government at USC. I lost student government at NYU Law. I ended up winning, but it's like not being scared of failure. 
Because like once you fail and you're like, okay, it's not that deep. I didn't die. Like whatever. Who cares? It's just like a little ego bruise. It makes you so much more brave that you're yeah. like, who cares? I could do it again. Yeah. And there's basically zero successful people no. who will not have a line of failures before them. I, it actually is like right. rite of passage. And it's like, I think a lot of people, especially now being a founder, it's like, it's so glamorized that people just assume you're an overnight success. But really, if you talk about to these founders, you'll find out it was like 15 years in the making they've been doing this and all the times they failed before, but you just don't hear about that or read about that. You just hear about the successful moment and being able to meet these other founders who are where I want to be and hearing about their own stories of failure is like, you're like, okay, this is, this is part of the journey. Very true. I've actually seen through media, this happens quite often where they'll say, oh yeah, I spent two, three years building this company and then we sold it for this like big amount. Right. But sure, maybe they spent a few years on that idea, but they're not talking about the seven ideas before right. to get to that idea that right. are very critical. Right. And I, I think that media in general also does like a really bad job of this. And there's some, on the other hand, there are like some stories that are like, oh, whatever, we worked for a couple of years and we sold this to this company. Then they won't disclose for how much. And right. you realize it's right. just an accu hire. They actually made no money. They actually lost money. Yes. Oh, that's all the time. I mean, that's actually most companies. That's most companies, and especially in today's like economic environment of what's going on. I think there's a lot of distressed companies and it's an aqua hire. Exactly. Yeah. So like you just buy out and then you kind of rip apart the business. Mm -hmm. And so- yeah. And then that's multiple years you're not taking a salary as well that you're not recuperating later through a sale. Exactly. And yep. like, it kind of adds up, right? Where real success comes from a decade. A like it, it literally, I've never seen on those few years. In those few years, they have like hidden messages behind those like big PR articles that we're not talking about. I definitely agree. And like all of the struggles also of getting there. It's like, I remember when I first started Flaus, I used to listen to How I Built This, which is like one of my favorite podcasts. And there were some episodes in there that were just were so critically important and so helpful. But there were a couple of other episodes um, where the founders would be talking about their success. And it was almost disheartening or frustrating to listen to because it just, they made it sound so easy. And I'm like, there's just no way it was that easy. And it's, it felt so unrealistic and unobtainable. Yeah. And then now fast forward a few years and you actually see some of these companies specifically are very distressed companies that are actually weren't doing that well. And it just kind of puts into perspective that some, a lot of this is smoke and mirrors yeah. and it's rare to find founders that are so open and transparent. And the truth is, like, maybe it's not that they're trying to keep things away. At that point, you're yeah. kind of, like, jaded. You, like, almost blacked out a 100%. lot of the past. You're like, yeah. it's like oh, traumatic. I guess I woke up and it happened. <laughs> because sometimes it's, like, hard to really see the the millions of tiny things you did to achieve that one take. You're like, oh, actually, all I did was, like, show up to that meeting and I finally got that big deal. Right, right. Which I can understand on the moment it really feels like that. Because it's actually really hard to contextualize the millions of things that got exactly. you in that room in the first place. Exactly. All the times you posted, all those emails you sent, like those little tiny yeah. inches of moments is like what gets you to that final yard line. Yeah. So you were actually in law school yes. and you were an attorney. Yes. Um, so I want to hear more about that. Yeah. And also I want to hear how you decided it was like worth it to risk leaving that to pursue yeah. entrepreneurship. That's a big thing. Huge. So after I went to USC, I went straight through to NYU Law, got my JD. And I grew up very much in a household that it's just me and my sister were 13 months apart. And my parents were like doctor or lawyer. That is how we were raised. So my sister went the pre-med route. I went the pre-law route. And after law school, I then came back to LA and I practiced mergers and acquisitions for four years at Skadden. And Skadden's like very, very prestigious law firm. Um, it was it was brutal working there, but an incredible experience. But I remember there were just moments that I just felt like this can't be it for me. Like I worked so hard to get here. I took on the student debt. I did all of these things. And I was just sitting there being like, I don't feel like I'm making an impact on the world. And I in some ways was kind of helping rich people get richer. And I was just, and while my sister was actually helping people in the hospital. And so I remember there was this really, it feels like an inconsequential moment where I was making this flower bouquet for Galentine's day. And I was doing a diligence memo on this huge deal. And I took a break to do this flower bouquet and I went back to doing the diligence memo. And in that moment, I thought, I just got more intrinsic value out of making a flower bouquet than I have had at one second at this job. And that's when I knew I was like, I am a creative. And while I obviously have strong analytical skills, I have to go see what else is out there for me. And luckily with a background in law, I, I think I was able to really just put into perspective that God forbid I failed, I could always go back to being a lawyer. The, jo the job will always be there. And so knowing you have that sort of safety net and 
And then going down that kind of rabbit hole of like, okay, let's say I leave Skadden and I start this company and then it fails. What then? Okay, I would have to go back out and get another job. What then? And it's like you go down that rabbit hole and you realize like it's not that deep. Like I'm going to be fine. I mean, this isn't life or death. And I think putting that into perspective of like there is a safety net there and you're going to be fine and you can rebuild. And this is the time to do it. It's not when you're – older with a huge family and responsibilities and like this is the time it's like take the risk and like you're never gonna regret an investment yourself yeah sometimes I say like if you are scared of entrepreneurship it is okay to take a few years to create more of that foundation for you 100% because you're actually not going to create create something successful with the fear of money, with the no, fear of failure. No, like, no, there is. You have to like be okay with any possible outcome to kind of be there just for the journey and not for the like where it ends up. A hundred percent. And like, ev- as you even mentioned, like every person who's had these crazy successes have had also crazy failures. And so recognizing that everything's happening exactly as it should, and like trusting the process and not getting too attached to the highs and the lows is that really only comes with experience of failing before, Mm -hmm. like in, in, in different ways. And, you know, at least for me, I was so nervous to leave the law firm because I had invested so much time, so much money. It was such a prestigious job and there's so much unknown leaving, but I went and I actually got an executive coach to help me because I really had to shift that perspective because from an evolutionary standpoint, your brain wants to keep you in your safety zone. That's just like, it keeps you safe. And so as you start venturing outside of your comfort zone, your brain will start firing off these signals, basically trying to convince you to stay. And greatness and growth is always on the outside of that comfort zone. And so it's just like pushing through and recognizing you are not your thoughts, you are not your feelings, and being recognizing that my brain is just doing this to keep me safe. I have to take this risk. And it's not life or death. I love the way you said that because a lot of it is not about what's actually happening, but it's yes. really your perception of it. Yes, yes, 100%. And transforming your perception of it is what transforms reality. A hundred percent. And like you even mentioned, not operating from a fear mindset, but more of an abundance mindset. I always try to do that. So like even now in my business, I've been doing it for five years and not looking at, you know, other companies or other founders as competition, but rather like there's enough room at the top for all of us. Whether you're successful doesn't diminish my possibility of being successful. And I think coming from that perspective, it's amazing all the things that start to fall into place. Yeah, no, and I actually really appreciate that you mentioned that you actually got an executive coach to help yes. you through this. The worst is like, you're like, I'm struggling with this and I'm just gonna sit here and and oh my gosh. not figure it out. No. It is so important to invest in yourself. Like 100%. Skip the skip the bag you were going to buy yes, that month. Yes, like, yes. Invest in yourself. Actually take the leap to do that executive coach. I actually have never really had an executive coach like properly. So I'd be curious to learn from you like how that's helped you and like what was that experience like? Oh, it was huge. So actually it was wild how it all came to be. So I was on LinkedIn and I actually, my great grand big in my sorority, so random. I was not close with her at all. She was posting a ton on LinkedIn about how she was doing executive coaching. And I just really resonated with her posts and her mindset. And so I actually ended up reaching out to her because I was struggling to leave the law firm. I was scared. And I reached out to her and her and I started working together. And it took us about a year for me to get ready to leave the law firm. But it was so incredibly helpful because she helped me think through all of the fears and all of like the like rumination I was doing. And she was helping me go down that rabbit hole and see at the end of the day, I was going to be fine. Like I I would end up fine. And that was just so, it was all about the perception shifting. And then also putting my mindset in like, I am, this is what's meant for me. I'm meant to be a founder. I'm meant to do this. And it just empowered me to be like, okay, I not only am I ready to do this, but I'm also capable. It's scary. I'm going into oral care as a lawyer, like no oral care background, no engineering background, but to be able to be like, you're smart enough and you are resilient enough to figure this out. Yeah. I just felt empowered that I was like, okay, I'm going to yeah. do this. Yeah. I mean, belief in yourself is Ugh. basically most of the journey. Like, oh you my can gosh. totally figure it all out. Yes. Um, I'm curious to actually learn from you how you actually took this idea and actually got to a prototype and like yeah. a product that yeah. you could actually sell. And if 
like your legal background was like helpful in any of this. I mean, so I came up with this idea and I immediately went into like diligence research mode of like how first, like why doesn't a product like this already exist? How big is the market opportunity? Who would be my target customer? I did all of these things before I put a dollar into Flaus. And then I ran a survey on SurveyMonkey, which I would recommend for any aspiring entrepreneurs to do. It cost about $1,000. It went out to 600 people across the US. And I asked them about one, their current flossing habits and their feelings about flossing, and then gave them two sentences about the product. And it was like, would you buy this? Yes or no? How did you get it to 600 people? SurveyMonkey. They do it all for you. They have an entire database of people. So you just choose exactly like the demographic you want for us. I mean, this is a product anyone can use. So it was nice so we could be really broad, but you could get really honed in. You could hone in on um, people who have jobs in nursing or lawyers and SurveyMonkey is an incredible tool. um, And I think it's really underrated. And I sent out that survey and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to see what the results come back as. And if it's not a green light, okay, so be it. I'm, I'll stay at the law firm. But if it is a green light, I'm going to start investing my money. Came back overwhelmingly positive. And I was like, okay. So then I went literally to Google and looked up engineers near me. That is what I did. And then I went and I found six different engineering companies, interviewed them all, selected one of them, and my neighbor was a dentist. So it's like just being resourceful that way of like, okay, who do I know in my outer or inner or outer circle? Who in my network can connect me to someone I need? And then just using Google and like figuring it out, especially I feel like us, like Gen Zers and millennials, like we are so much like so like tech forward that we have so many resources at our fingertips that prior generations did not, that you can just like literally figure it out in a day. Yeah, totally. I mean, so many tools and resources to like speed run the entire process where before you need literally teams of engineers to do, and now you can literally do it on Google. You could do it on Google. You can now, especially with chat GPT now. And then, yeah, so I went and found out this, I found this engineer and I just thought, okay, I love my electric toothbrush. Let's use that as the starting base. So we started prototyping just around that. And he would send me designs. And I remember his designs he would send. I would take them and cut them in half. I was like, it needs to be small. It needs to be compact. It needs to be sleek. And it was really just my vision of what this product would be. It was so clear in my mind. And I'm definitely more of a visionary founder than um, an integrator or executioner. And so the vision was so, so clear. And um yeah, just I really just trusted the process and honestly really leaned into customer feedback. So like during this time, it was COVID. This was all happening during COVID. I would drive around LA and have all of my friends using Flaus, giving me feedback on Flaus, filling out surveys. And I would just let the data direct me. I never really tried to let my ego take me in any direction. It was like, what is the data saying? And Mm -hmm. I'm just going to follow that. Yeah. And then I saw that you pre-sold $300,000 of product on Indiegogo. Yes. So crowdfunding campaign. Yes. Um, one, did that really give you the conviction to like actually bring it to market? Mm-hmm. Was that what you needed? Again, yes. it, the data showed. Yes. Um, but two, like how do you even go about making a crowdfunding campaign and like getting people to care about being in it? Exactly. So as I was going through this process, I noticed that because especially with a product like Flaus, it's consumer electronic hardware. So it's really capital intensive. I invested a significant amount of my savings, but then I had to go raise money. And I was able to raise money from family and friends just based on the idea. Then it was the survey results. And then I had to run like a email wait list. And I literally brought, bought the book, like Facebook for dummies, Facebook marketing for dummies. I am not kidding. And that's how I learned how to run my own Facebook ads. Like it's that simple. And I then had that wait list and then people gave me money after that. And then it became, we want to see that people are willing to put down their credit card for this. And I was like, I don't have a product. How am I going to do this? And there was two options. I could either run it through a crowdfunding campaign like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or do a wait list on my own website. And I decided to go with Indiegogo because those consumers understand that they are at the baseline ground level foundation customers. They're not expecting to receive a near perfect product like a normal consumer online would. And these consumers also understand that you haven't even manufactured the product yet. So they're way more patient. They're way more willing to wait because a lot of these Indiegogo and Kickstarter customers are serial customers of that platform. So they understand how this works. Whereas a direct consumer customer 
because of Amazon wants it in two to three days. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, we're going to do it on Indiegogo. I then went out and what I did is I went on both Indiegogo and Kickstarter and I looked up similar parallel verticals to me. So electric toothbrushes, electric razors. And I would notice that all of those successful campaigns were all working with a crowdfunding agency. So then I was able to identify the top t five crowdfunding agencies and I interviewed all of them. And then from there, so it's a similar pattern to how I found my engineer. Did the same thing for the crowdfunding agency. I identified the one I wanted to work with. And when we decided to launch that campaign in April, that was the, the flag in the sand for me that I knew I had to put in my notice at the law firm. Mm -hmm. I was like, this cannot go public while I'm still at this law firm. Yeah. So that really forced me to put in my notice and leave. And I was just betting on this campaign. Like what, if this went really, really well, it would give me the proof of concept to go into manufacturing, to raise the rest of the money I needed to build this company. And Luckily, I mean, it went. It was a huge success. We finished in the top 1% of Indiegogo campaigns ever. And, you know, it was $340,000. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but I mean, there's so many failed campaigns yeah. and it's public. So that was definitely a fear of mine that I was like, you know, God forbid this goes sideways. It's going to be on there forever. But again, like you just can't operate from a fear mindset. Yeah. It's just like, I'm like, I'm going to do everything I can to make this successful. And all of the signs showed me that it would be in it and it was. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's literally like so interesting to hear you go through the story because it's yes. very obvious. None of us know how to start a business. No. Like, there are no like rule book or right. roadmap or steps. Right. It's literally like taking like logical clues. Yes. Asking critically, asking yourself these questions and then putting stake in the game. Yes. Actually pre-selling products. So like if now you have a bunch of people's money, you actually have to make a product. Yes. Or yes. going public on a campaign is like, that's literally making yourself accountable. Like I have to quit my job at that point. Yes. And it's like putting in those metrics in place for you and then seeing what happens, being comfortable and okay, not having that fear-driven mindset and then asking yourself, okay, what is the logical next step? Because there's no rule book. There's no rule book. And something that's really benefited me is um, the power of networking and going to find people who have been in the positions I want to be in. So going to find people who've had successful campaigns and talking to them about their experience and what helped them and finding people even now that are reaching the revenue milestones. I was just with someone like that this morning and learning from them. That is truly the key to all of this is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Go and learn from the people that are in the positions you want to be in. Yeah. I mean, the most helpful networking I've done is not reaching out to this billion dollar founder who's super yeah. famous. Like, no. it's never that. It's like, what is the very specific thing you're trying to get good at? In your case, let's say it was this crowdfunding campaign. Okay. Don't go to like successful entrepreneurs. Go to like successful crown funds. Yes. And like, yes. like actually directly ask people. And it doesn't have to be this like super senior person. No. They're likely to be the most unhelpful because they're too far away from the like nitty gritty details of like, what you're looking for. It's kind of like we said with the how I built this podcast yes. where like sometimes they're almost like too vague and they act yes. like it wasn't that, you know, hard to do because they're too far from the actual journey at that point. Like too much time has passed. A hundred percent. And then also to not even just, you want to talk to people who've had successful campaigns, but you also want to talk to people who had unsuccessful campaigns. There's so much to learn from people's failures as well. And you'd be so surprised how helpful people are and how much they want to share and help. And I just cold outreach on LinkedIn. That's what I do. I cold DM and the amount of investors and advisors I've gotten from that, it's just been incredible. Yeah, cold messaging is my Bible. I mean, it's, like it's the only way to do it. It's the only way to do it. And I get a lot of inbound cold DMs, but like if someone really strikes, like it makes a lot of sense about why they're reaching out. And especially if it's a female founder, I just, that's something I'm personally really passionate about is helping other females. I always take the time to respond and like, I will get on calls. I'll try to open up my network. Um, and yeah, like with Dr. Jason, he's the founder of Therabody. He's one of my most trusted advisors. Um, and he was cold, cold emails, like 30 cold emails before I got my first meeting. People forget that just like them, other people want to be helpful. Uh, like we're not all evil people who no, want to ignore. No, no. And it like, feels trust like, in, like yes, humankind. exactly. And just put it out there. And the worst that people can say is either one, ignore you or two, no. Yeah. And whatever. And get used to hearing no. Also, you don't have time to look back and see no. who said no. No. Like you're probably going to be over like. A hundred percent. I literally, especially for fundraising, my mindset, when someone says no, I'm like, thank you. Next. Yeah. Next. Bye. Yeah. Water yeah. off a duck's yeah. back. Like you, every no is getting you closer to your yes. Yeah. Oh, I say like message so many people that you literally lose track of your nose. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't bother you. No, exactly. And you're just like, and 
every I like to look at my nose, especially if they give me any sort of like constructive feedback, because there's always like grains of truth in there. But for the most part, I'm just like really getting in, especially my first two million dollars I raised was all family and friends. So that was a huge mindset shift of like that pressure of taking on people that you know in your everyday life, their money. And some people who are really successful, some people who weren't. But that mindset shift of being like, their money is better invested in me than it going somewhere else. They're clearly going to put it somewhere and I'd rather have it stay with me. And then when I dealt with no's with people from I knew, it was really trying to be like, this isn't, it's not personal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more of a reflection of whatever they have going on in their life than whether I am a good founder or I have a good business. Yeah. I yeah. mean, honestly, props to you to not take it personal. Yeah. I think that's actually very difficult to do in practice. So hard. You can I mean, say like, I yeah. am not going to take it personal. No. But then when it, the no actually happens, you're like, wait, yeah. I really like didn't think you it's were going to not show up for me. I, oh my gosh. And I've, I've been so disappointed in some people. I'm not going to lie. Like some of my, like a couple of my closest friends, I was definitely, you know, I think people reveal themselves in these moments, but also too, it's like, yeah, you just don't know what's going on in a lot of people's lives. Like some people are trying for kids. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, grew up in different situations. And so you try not to take it personally. And yeah. that's just off of repetition because I am a people pleaser. I am very sensitive. I'm an Aquarius. I'm very sensitive. And, um, but that's just something over time. I think my skin has gotten thicker where I'm like, okay, thank you next. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. No, that's, that's really interesting to hear. I yeah. honestly, I don't know if I would have the guts be like fully transparent because I feel like I would take it personally. And yeah. maybe the, the truth of the matter is like, you need to be like prepared for the emotional aspects of doing that. Yes. Or maybe don't do it. I don't do it. But where else are you supposed to raise money? Especially mm -hmm. as a female founder doing consumer electronic hardware. It just, I had yeah, nowhere else point. to go but to my friends and family. Yeah. And luckily my law firm rallied around me. My first 15 investors were all people at the law firm, including my partners. That's phenomenal. Well, I was there and I was a rising star and I would just explain to them like, look at how much I'm excelling here. Imagine what I can do when I'm working on something I'm passionate about. It's so that important to not burn bridges literally Ugh. anywhere for these reasons. You never know what you're going to do in the future. You and who You never helpful. know. And like you asked, like, how's my legal background come in to help me? I mean, it has helped in so many different ways. First, I, I review every legal contract. There is not a contract that comes across my desk that's not marked up. I am constantly marking things up because it's, you'd be shocked what people just sign. It's, and especially having my corporate background, we would have to clean up the mess a lot. And so it's something I'm hyper aware of that I'm like, I'm making sure that if I'm agreeing to a six month contract, there needs to be a 30 day opt out period in there. Like there's things or like the IP that's super important, but the way that it legitimizes me as a female founder, mm -hmm. the, the vibe of a conversation completely shifts when they find out that my background's in law. It's just, it, it just validates you mm -hmm. and it has been one of the best, best skill sets to have. And yeah, I mean, you're just a problem solver as a lawyer. You're always looking for the issues. And some, sometimes that can be a weakness of mine because I'm always like, how are, what's the million ways this could go wrong? But it's also such a, a, a like immense skill set to have because I'm always looking for the grenades. Yeah, I'm like, where, where's the grenades in this? And as a founder, you can't be too risk averse, but it's helpful to be thinking about all these things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I hate to validate you on this, but the importance <laughs> of clout as a woman oh, I, in this space, yeah. like it's, I, I wish we didn't need to bring I this agree. clout. I agree. But, but I do think like it does help. Like I come previously cut, come from big tech experience. I was a product manager and doing what I do today, like, trust me, I get so much more respect 100%. just because I have that background. 100%. And I just think like this whole experience would go very differently for me me if I hadn't had that foundational background and it's it sucks because you're kind of like oh people are pretty superficial like they're looking for accolades but that's a like that's a reality we live in like you can have a victim mindset or you can kind of prepare yourself for that and then like rise above it and Definitely. then and I agree I think like the only way to actually change this in the future is actually being okay with it now so then I can bring other women with me yes and then I can look at them yes. for their merit and not their accolades yes I 100 percent because even like going to law school, taking the LSAT, taking the bar, like the way our society is set up with these tests and these tests don't necessarily, they're not necessarily a perfect indicator of whether you are going to be like a high functioning member of society yeah. and, a, and a boss and someone who can like just grind it out. It's, 
And so to have such a huge emphasis on these merits is, or as you mentioned, like accolades and your own experience is in some ways really silly, but it's also like you kind of have to, you're part of this game. And my, yes. my hope and exactly what you said is like, my hope is that once I ideally can get to the top is lifting up other women with me. So they don't need to experience the same struggles I'm experiencing. Whereas so many, especially I feel like of the older generation feel like because they struggled to get to the top, we should struggle oh too. My God. And it's so yeah. disappointing. I'm like, it, it's such a reversed mindset. Whereas men with this boys club, it's like one guy gets it and they want to bring their friends along. But it's not like that with no, women. No, I mean, you can literally say that a hundred times. I <sighs> literally like, I feel really like the day to day of what I'm doing sometimes can be really difficult because yeah, I'm, sure. I'm kind of like older Gen Z mm-hmm. and so I'm pretty close to millennial and they- Zillennials. I know, literally. And I really struggle because they're very actively threatened, I think, by the next generation and trying to gatekeep because that was basically, it's not their fault. That no. is just what they've been taught. Exactly. And like, I'm really excited to see that like our generation is like actively trying to reverse that and improve yes. that. Um, but like, I still wonder, like, do you, like the way the boys club operates yeah. and the way that they have each other's back so blindly and lift each other up, like, Will we ever get there? Like, I actually, like, sometimes I'm nervous that it's so far for us. I It, it does seem like it's far, but I feel like so, like, we've been making such huge strides and improvements. Yeah. And the fact we're even talking about this, yeah. I truly believe Gen Z is going to, like, save the world. I'm like, Gen Z is coming out swinging in a bunch of different ways and making change. I'm just like, and I'm excited for Gen Alpha, the mm-hmm. next one. I'm, like, growing up and being like, we're sick of this shit. Like, we're sick of how this is done. This doesn't make sense. Seeing how much people have struggled and being like, we're going to do it different and questioning the status quo. And I'm confident that Gen Z is going to make such huge strides forward. And then Gen Alpha is going to come and like close totally. it. I mean, there are more entrepreneurs than ever before. And that's like just <laughs> exactly. the perfect sign that like people are tired of work, being part of this like corporate game yes. simulation yes. that like they didn't want to sign up for and they want to like write their own rules. A hundred percent. And it's just so much better like supporting another person. I get so much intrinsic value out of helping other founders. And like I try to surround myself with awesome female founders because it's really lonely and a lot of these men no offense but they just don't understand the experience it's like and uh, which I don't blame them I don't blame them yeah. but it's like the they disparity yeah. that exists is so I mean it's just so obvious it's so glaring and it pops up in different ways but you know I just try to like do what I can so that I can get to the end the finish line and help the people behind me yeah have you ever experienced like discrimination or sexism in the space um you know, in certain ways, I definitely have. I've heard of some horror stories some, from some of my female founder friends that I'm so thankful that I have not personally experienced, mm-hmm. like being, you know, like sexualized during pitches and things like that. I've never experienced that. Um, and I think it's probably my like lawyer, but I don't, I just am very serious in those contexts. So I don't know if I give off that vibe or I'm not sure what it is. But for me, it's something I have experienced is as a female founder, it's so important for me to get funding from other female founders or female funds. That's something I'm really focused on because right now about 80% of my cap table is, is men. And so I want to have more women. It has been so incredibly difficult to raise money from women. It is so much more difficult than raising money from from men. It is, I, I think that there's two reasons for it. I think one, I think that these women, they are under such high scrutiny from their LPs and GPs who are mostly men that they are expected to have these crazy, crazy high returns that they're th- it then trickles down to the founders and the startups that they're looking at. And they have such high thresholds that it's almost impossible to meet. And then, so I think that's one aspect is like the patriarchy is still damaging even these female funds. But then something else we talked about is I think that there's a lot of women who just are not as supportive of women and who intentionally make it more difficult. And yeah, I mean, female funding is down even lower than 2%, but there's more and more female funds popping up. Yeah. Why why is that? Why isn't there more money going towards women? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really true. It's kind of this like, um, intrinsic thing that society has taught us that 
wait, only one woman in the room can exist and can succeed. And then the, once that becomes rooted in like how you view the world, then all of a sudden you feel you're in competition with every woman that you ever meet. And how could you possibly invest in that? I'm, I agree. And but then the data shows us that women are just more high, like much, much more efficient operators. They're much, much more successful. They have way bigger exits. And so it's like, that's really where the money should be going. And yeah, I think I've just been really disappointed because there's a lot of these, there are some incredible female funds. Um, I have the fund XX, they invested. I have some incredible female investors, Rachel from Wellness Growth Ventures, um, Candice from Sprinkles Cupcakes from Shark Tank. She invested, she's fabulous. But it's just how difficult it's been from raising from these other female funds. And they sit there and they're like, oh, well, we invest in revolutionary, visionary, early stage female founders. But then you make it so difficult to get that paycheck that it's, or that paycheck, sorry, that investment check that it's kind of like, it feels almost like a disservice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And you spend so much time talking to them. Then it's like, it ends up being a no. And you're like, wait, I just was able to raise 5x the amount of money from these male investors with way less effort. Like what's going on there? Yeah. I mean, I also want to touch on what you said earlier, which is a lot of the women in VC yeah. are not actually in control of the money and yes. where they put it. Yes. Like their LPs that are mm -hmm. all, basically all men are the ones mm -hmm. actually controlling them yep. and that, or their GP is yep. the one who's like making the final decision. So, so even in the cases where there are women who are not trying to be competitive, who are trying 100%. to support women, don't actually have the power to do so. And I really, really hate that I'm saying on this, this on the pod right now, but I do think some women in VC get hired because it makes their fun look good. And they have that like, the look of like, okay, they can kind of be the like front person, the one who represents the image behind right. their brand, but they're just merely a figurehead, which is so, so messed up to say. And I hate that this is real, but like the only step to like the you we have to acknowledge it to ever actually try to I, you, talk you have it. to acknowledge it and it's yeah. like yeah finding these funds that not only talk the talk but walk the walk exactly what you're saying and i do think a lot of it has to come down to you know men controlling the, the money these lps and it's like these female vcs are under such high scrutiny to have such crazy returns that it makes sense that it trickles down and they're having a hard time raising money. So it's like, if they're having a hard time raising money, it's gonna trickle down to the female founders who then aren't able to access that capital because they the VC funds don't have capital to deploy. Yep, yep. It's like, a, it's just kind of an, a never ending cycle, but I do think there's a lot of strides being made. Mm -hmm. I feel optimistic about the future. I think there's awesome females going into investing into decision-making roles. And I'm, I'm feeling optimistic. It's just to actually be kind of experiencing it and mm -hmm. seeing the, uh, disparity between myself and some of my male counterparts who are mm -hmm. founders, it's wild. What's your best advice for female founders navigating this? Yeah, I think my best advice for female founders navigating this is to remain optimistic and persistent. Again, every no gets you closer to your yes. So getting to those no's as quickly as possible. I don't like to get conversations dragged out. Um, for anyone raising money, I typically have I my average call number of meetings to a check is one and a half meetings to a check. So I'm not someone that will sit on multiple calls. And to the extent that's happening, I think you really need to question whether this is just like a fishing expedition for information and whether they it's just a soft no, which is still a no. Yep. You know, it's get to that no as quickly as possible. And as you said, like throw up as many balls against the wall as possible and eventually one will stick. Yeah, no. It's a numbers I, game. I could not agree more. It, it, everything is a numbers game. Yes. And so like seeing it like that is the best way to detach from the process. Exactly. Right. It's not me. It's just the it's just the process. It's, the process. it's just the numbers game that we're it, yes, in. Yes. Yep. Exactly. And so I hope that's helpful. And that's helped me. It's just, you know, and then yeah, finding these funds that have invested in similar verticals to yours. That's so important because so many people can go out trying to go to these certain tier VCs or institutional investors, but if they haven't invested in your category, in your segment, it's a waste of time. Yeah. Like you want to go after people who are investing in your area. Yeah. yeah. And you were on Shark Tank. Yes. That was, that is so ah. cool. Um, how did you get on it? Yes. Like, what was it like being on such a big platform? Like, oh. tell us about the experience. Yeah, it was amazing. So they actually headhunted me from Indiegogo. So oh, that's where they first cool. found me. So they, it makes a lot of sense that they have people out on the markets looking at cool, innovative new companies. They're obviously going to go to a Kickstarter and Indiegogo because that's where a lot of them come from. And so we were first reached out to by Shark Tank in 2021. But again, we didn't have a product. So I was like, you know, it's all about timing. You yes. you don't need to say yes to every opportunity. So 
I just kind of put it on ice. And then in 2022, um, we won the South by Southwest pitch competition. And I ended up meeting Mark Cuban's manager. And I ended up meeting him at this TikTok party. And I wanted to try to get to Mark, but like he was like surrounded by people. So I was talking to his manager and his manager was like, you know, clearly vibing at this party. And I was like, I just don't know how productive of a conversation this is going to be. But I got his name and I ended up getting Mark's email the next day. And I shot Mark an email saying his manager's name said you needed to floss more and gave him like a little blurb about the company. And Mark responded within 20 minutes, 20 minutes, responded back to me, CC'd the executive producer and was like, I think you'd be great for Shark Tank. And then that kind of just put me back into that didn't guarantee anything, obviously. And then Mark was not involved with anything else after that. But that just kind of like reignited everything. And so then it was from 2022, I re-engaged with Shark Tank. And then I ended up not filming until September, 2023. So it's a really long process. Like you go through a lot of business diligence. They wanna make sure everything you're saying on air is factual and true. So you undergo a ton of diligence and then you obviously wanna make sure your product's ready and you have like inventory to ship, to sell. And so September, 2023, I filmed and it was the most amazing experience ever like it was a dream come true I grew up watching the show standing there when like the big doors open and walking out and you're pitching in front of these sharks it was like it was it was a dream come true and like I just felt like I I honestly had been manifesting this every year before the end of the year I will do six sticky notes around my mirror about the six goals I have for the year and I will literally like repeat them to myself throughout the year and one by one they happen. And one of them was Shark Tank 2023. And to actually have it happen and it to go so well. Like I walked out of there. I had three offers. I had a bidding war. It was best case scenario. And I knew I wanted Candace of Sprinkles Cupcakes because she's so female empowerment, female friendly. She has an incredible network. She's built an amazing brand. So going into it, I already knew I wanted her. And so to be able to walk out with her as my investor, it was just, yeah, it was a dream come true. And What's interesting is um, you don't know you're going to actually air until three weeks before. So I only found out I was airing. I just aired on the season finale in May, and I didn't find out I was airing until April. So you only have three weeks to get all the inventory ready, to get the PR going, to get the packaging, to get the website, the SEO. Like there's so much that goes into it. But then once like I had a watch party as it was happening with all my investors and friends and to get to see, as we talked about, it's not like I just ended up here. All of that hard work, all of those tiny nano steps that got me here. It was just so rewarding to get to watch it all unfold. Yeah. And in some ways, that cold message to Mark Cuban, you not only sending the message in that moment, but then seizing the opportunity at the party, yes. showing up to the party. Yes. Like, yes. All of that matters. Yes. Like You could have just not do one of those things. And maybe for all you 100%. know, this would have never happened. You 100%. just don't know. You have to put yourself like a lot of the journey of being a founder is luck. A lot of it is luck and you need to put yourself in positions to be lucky. Yep. You have to go to these things. You have to put yourself out there. And again, it's removing this like ego and fear of like, what if they ignore me? What if they, what if? Yeah. Totally. What if, who cares? Yeah. Like, and so it's like putting your positions in opportunity, like having that opportunity to be lucky. And I mean, Shark Tank was massive, yeah. massive. Oh, I'm sure. So, so you have the watch party. Yeah. You have your website ready. Yes. What happens? Like, does it fundamentally change your business, actually? Fundamentally. So, wow. okay. Well, so also, you don't you don't get to pre-see the episode. So, like, you don't know what kind of edit you're going to get. You're out there for an hour. They only air 10 minutes of it. And with my lawyer background, I was certainly, you know, for lack of a better word, um, challenging some of the sharks on some of their logic. And I was nervous. I was like, oh, God, like, are they going to air some of this? You know, you can take things out of context. And so I'm sitting there and the way that it airs, it was at 8 p.m. Eastern time and 8 p.m. Pacific time. So it's two different airing times. So I got to watch, I did not actually watch the 8 p.m. Eastern time, but I was on my Shopify looking at like all of the sales come in. I am not kidding. It went from 30 visitors. And as soon as I went live, I was the last segment, it went to 30,000. Wow. You see on Shopify, everyone popping up on the East Coast. It was we did our entire previous month of revenue in four hours that night. We did our entire first year of revenue within uh, 24 hours. 
it was game changing. We unfortunately we sold out of product because it went so well. So we were like, people had told me what to expect, but we five X'd it. Wow. And so we ran out of inventory. It was kind of, you know, a champagne problem. But then getting to watch it live with my friends and family, it was just like it, it was surreal. I was like, that's me on TV. The sharks are actually using flouse. They're flossing on like it was just, <laughs> it fundamentally changed the business. And I think Shark Tank. Granted, it's been around for 15 years. So it's like a little chuggy. It's been there, done that. But it provides this like element of credibility Mm -hmm. and brand awareness. Because as a new product right now in our earliest stages, we're focused on the top of funnel brand awareness. So to be able to have, you know, 3 million, 4 million people watching this episode was huge. Huge. And I'm sure you reap a lot of benefits now in terms of- Yes, there's a halo effect. There's a halo effect and we get to use like as seen on Shark Tank, that little logo. I mean, Candace is an investor now. And so there's definitely a halo effect. And like tomorrow, actually we're re-airing tomorrow night. So, I mean, it's Wednesday night at 10 p.m. So it's gonna be very random, but- it's still like you get these little bumps and then it gets, um, and then you're going to be, eventually it gets um, brought over to CNBC and then they, you know, you kind of, people at the gym, they'll just have like Shark Tank going over and over again. And you just constantly see these little revenue bumps. It it, honestly, I could not recommend it more. It was the best experience and Shark, the whole Shark Tank family, I'm going to a Shark Tank reunion in Tampa in October. That's so cool. With the founder of Poppy, the founder of Bala Bangles, the founder of Dude Wipes, like so many cool iconic brands. And it's like this community. I'm I'm just so excited. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a lot of pressure and expectations you have now of like delivering on your product yes. and continuing ne- like needing to excel and exceed like the revenue they're doing. Like how do you manage and balance all that? Yeah. I mean, I'm it's a lot. It's really hard. Um, we talked about having an executive coach. I also have a therapist. <laughs> um, and I really, really like I have therapy later today and like, I make sure I don't miss those appointments because it's, it's a really lonely journey. It's I'm, you know, we're doing significant amount of revenue and it's me and one other girl. It's a teeny tiny team. Um, and it's a ton of pressure. And especially cause I have moments where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. But then one of my experiences at Skadden and something I would definitely like want to tell your viewers and listeners is that the secret to life is that no one knows what they're doing. (laughs) No one knows. And it's all about just figuring it out. And, you know, I really rely on my meditation. I try to journal, like get out all these thoughts in my brain and get it out to paper. And again, going to my network of founders and advisors. So Dr. Jason of Therabody, um, Roy of Yeti Coolers, um, Simon of Quip. Like I have these founders who who are advisors and investors And I can just go to them and be so honest and transparent. Like, I don't feel the need to put on this like facade. Oh, everything's going great. I'm like, I'm about to implode. And then they're like, you, when's the last time you took a vacation? I'm like six months ago. They're like, let's get one scheduled in the next two weeks because you're going to burn out. And so I just try to really, the most important thing for the health of the business and this pressure is taking care of myself. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I try to prioritize that and just talk to my founder friends of like how normal, I guess it just normalizes it. Then like, it's normal. I feel this way. And I try to also like be really strategic. Like there's some decisions I could have made for this year that would put us at, you know, a thousand percent growth from last year. But I'm like, I don't need to pull on those levers yet. I can do that next year. Like Mm -hmm. we're going to have 600% to 700% growth this year. And I'm like, that's enough. Like, I don't need to do that's more. insane. Yeah. It's God, been, congratulations. thank you. It's been, I mean, it, it's been amazing. And this is a product truly, this is, it, it's a category. It's a category that's meant to exist. We're a category creator and the electric toothbrush market is a multi-billion dollar market. The water flosser market is a multi-billion dollar market. Why wouldn't electric flossers be that way? And so yeah. I see this opportunity. It's a massive, massive opportunity. I'm not going to be the only one in the space, but it feels like such an honor and a privilege to get to be building it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And I don't think enough founders talk about and normalize like how important therapy is. Like it's you so can important. have your personal board of yeah. advisors, all yes. your investors, all these mentors and role models you look up to who you actually have been in contact with, but that doesn't mean that therapy is not going to be fundamentally like, so helpful for you and 
I feel like therapy therapy is only in the context of like personal relationships, but why can't therapy be an oh assistance gosh. to you in like quite one of the hardest things you'll probably ever do in your life, which is start a business? Absolutely. Like, that's insane. It's insane. And like, it's such a lonely journey. And to have someone that you can just confide in and say like your crazy thoughts that you like would not want to say to someone else. It's just, it's so, I mean- yeah, I've been seeing my therapist for, I guess, four years. And I'm <laughs> like, I don't know what I would do without her. Like, yeah. it, it's so important. I really try not to miss my meetings because just it's just perspective shifting. And again, like, I mean, even though I try to come from an abundance mindset, I always have moments where I get fearful. Yeah. And she's always like fear versus facts, fear versus facts. She's like, well, what are the facts of the situation? Yeah. And I'll list out the facts. And I'm like, wait, you're right. Like, I don't actually have a reason because I think it's like 95% of the things we worry about and fear never actually happen. And you spend- I think there's a Mark Twain yes, quote. Yes, it's Is like, that what you're talking about? No, it's from someone else, oh but my I, God. I believe that. It's, yeah. I mean, we just spend so much time and energy being nervous about things. And so especially real. like with social media, the news cycle, everything's like this, like for lack, like fear porn that happens. And our minds are so stimulated that we're just like constantly like firing on all cylinders. And it's just so helpful to be like, okay, what are the actual- facts what are the what's the actual reality versus mm-hmm. this like anxious reality that can be up in my head yeah and and I think expecting ourselves to show up like that every single day I think is unrealistic totally being okay with being like yes in those moments instead of being like I can't do it today we'll seek help we'll see Get, exactly like find a way to resolve it and continue on that like abundance mindset yes like, and track. giving yourself space and patience and grace to have off days like mm-hmm. I have days where I feel burnt out and it's so easy to like beat myself up. Oh, I wasn't productive enough. I didn't blah, blah, blah. But it's like, I'm a human being. I'm doing a lot. I have a lot of pressure, a lot of decisions. And like, it's totally normal if I just need a day to be a couch potato and to go hide underneath my blanket and rot on TikTok. Like, I don't know. Sometimes you just need that. And then the next day I'm up and I'm firing and I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious who's your role model. Oh my gosh. I mean, I have so many different ones. I think one of, and this one's a little cliche, but honestly, my mom has been someone who is one of the hardest workers and she sacrificed so much for my sister and I and our success. And she was one of like her first siblings to go to college and then get her graduate degree. And she was, I remember growing up, she was always like, she always really prioritized education because she's like, you never want to have to rely on another person. and specifically a man. She was like, you always want to have that sense of independence that you can take care of yourself Mm -hmm. and you don't have to rely on another person. And she also always told me that I could do anything I wanted. Like there was no limit. And I think that's what's given me like the courage and the bravery is like, yeah, I could, I'm I'm capable of anything I put my mind to. And my mom really instilled that in my sister and I. Yeah, no, it's so inspiring. And it's really important to know that really anyone can be an entrepreneur. Anyone. You don't need a traditional background to do it. No. You just need to be okay with the ambiguity and be okay with the fear that comes with it. And it's normal. It's just normal. It's so normal. And I actually think your background is like perfect for starting to dabble in the entrepreneurial world is like starting to work at some of these companies that you're interested in and like seeing like, how are they run? How are the products developed? How do they deal with customer service? How are they dealing with the financings of it? Kind of dabbling like with what you did and doing big tech, I just think is such a great place to start. Yeah, totally. It's these very adult things that seem so scary on the outside. But once you're on the inside, you're like, it's not that bad. And it almost gives you the confidence. You're like, you know, I could probably do it too. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, what's that TikTok? It's like, guys can do it. So can I. It's it's not that hard. And I mean, it is really hard, but I agree. I don't think you have to come from like any specific sort of background. You just kind of throw yourself in. And especially if it's something you're passionate about, I don't think you'll ever regret going for it. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah, this thank you so, so much for having me. This so was good to so hear great. Your story. Thank I'm, you. I'm very excited to start with my electric flosser yeah, starting I'm tonight. So, I am so excited. I can't <laughs> wait to hear what you think. Um, I'm so excited for you to start using flaus. And yeah, it was such an honor to get to be on here and chat with you. And yeah, hopefully we inspire some some ladies. <laughs>